Copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. Mexico State Police calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 298 regarding a murder. The 5th Lincoln County officer. That's all. Rolls and clues. Grande Cracked Gasoline has powered more police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment wherever it has been sold than any other brand. Folks, this statement is significant. Significant that Rio Grande Cracked has always been a superior gasoline, one of the best sold on the market. But our engineers felt they could produce a better gasoline, and after months of experimenting, perfected a new and different gasoline. Instead of the three ingredients found in ordinary gasoline, the new all-purpose Rio Grande Crack contains six ingredients, perfectly blended to give you more power, more mileage, more speed, and better performance. I realize that so many extravagant statements are made about various products that you might think this is just another claim. But friends, I assure you that this is not the case. To prove it, will you do this for me? Next time you need gasoline, drive into a red and white Rio Grande service station and fill up with new, all-purpose Rio Grande cracks. One test in your own car will prove that it's virtually liquid dynamite. The story we are to hear tonight has been taken in the main from the confidential files of the state police of New Mexico. We have therefore asked Chief Tom Summers to prepare a foreword for our program. When a person thinks of New Mexico... He is likely to visualize vast stretches of uninhabited desert. He has been led to believe the entire West is like that. Such, however, is not the truth. New Mexico considers itself one of the more fortunate states, especially is this true when it comes to scientific crime detection. Test tubes and microscopes now make it virtually impossible to mistake the identity of a person who has left his trademark at the scene of a crime. Even the master criminal has failed to produce the perfect crime, the one in which no clue is left behind. It is these telltale traces that the modern detective uses to make his deduction and unerring it, as well as invitably. He brings home to the lawbreaker the lesson of the losing nature of crime. As our program progresses, we shall learn how this science of crime detection helps solve a baffling case. On the morning of July 23rd, 1938, Captain Jack L. Nichols, in charge of the state police at Roswell, New Mexico, received a telephone call from Sheriff S. E. Grison of Lincoln County. Yes. Hello. Hello. Hey, Nichols. This is Sheriff Dryden. I'm calling from Ansel. Oh, yes, Sheriff. What can I do for you? There was a double killing here last night. I thought maybe I'd better call you and see if you wanted to come over here and take charge of the investigation. Oh, a murder, huh? Yeah, no doubt about that. Well, look, Sheriff. You see that nothing's touched, will you? I'll get over there as soon as I can. Now, when do you figure that'll be? Well, the better part of three hours anyway. It's well over 100 miles from here to Ansel, you know. Oh, howdy, Nichols. You didn't have much trouble finding me, did you? Well, not in a town of a couple of hundred people, Sheriff. Besides, I can see the crowd gathered around here. Yeah, there's quite a few folks hanging around the place. My boys have seen they didn't disturb anything, though. This is where the killings happened, is it? Yep. You can see it's a combination service station and grocery store. Who owns the place? Frank Hawley. He's one of the men that was killed. I see. And who was the other one? Bill Fletcher. He's a young fellow that worked for Hawley. What was the motive, Sheriff? Robbery? Looks like it. Uh, but come on, have a look for yourself. The bodies are around back. You kept the crowd away from where the bodies were found? Oh, sure. Hawley lived here in the store, I suppose. Yep. 
He had a couple of rooms fixed up in the rear. That's where he was killed. He was killed inside the place? That's right. Now, you'll see in a minute. Well, uh, what about the Fletcher boy? Was he inside, too? No, uh, his body is just around the corner here. There, you can see it now, just a few steps away from the back door. Oh, yes. Shot, huh? In the head. Have you looked around here for footprints? Yep, uh, found two or three pretty clear ones, too. A few more got stamped up by the folks milling around here earlier, before my boys could get them away from here. Oh. Are these the footprints you mean? Yeah, those are the ones. Well, they are pretty clear at that. Good. Well, there's plastic cast made of them. Uh, that's an idea, or at least it will be if we can find the shoes to fit them. There's no point in you police officers fooling around here. Get Pedro Sanchez. He's the bozo who's done it. What's that? Who's that fellow just hollered at us, Sheriff? <laughs> Him? Oh, he's just one of the crowd. Some of them's got the notion Pedro Sanchez is mixed up in this. Seems to me I've heard of Sanchez. Isn't he the local bad man around here or something like that? Well, he's a pretty tough customer, all right, but I don't think he had anything to do with this killing. Why not? We've already talked to him. As far as I can see, he's got an airtight alibi. And what gives some of these people the idea that Sanchez is the killer? Well, anything that goes haywire around here, folks right away blame it on to him. Hmm. Not a very choice reputation, is he? Nope. Well, let's go inside. Maybe you can find something there that we overlook. Okay. Uh, when we first got here, the boys and me, both this screen door and the side door were locked from the inside. Then whoever killed Holly never got in the place, is that it? That's it. Now, there's Holly's body lying across the bed there. Mm, he was shot too, huh? Yep. Uh, the bullet come through the screen and the glass of the window. You can see by looking at the holes that have come through from the outside. Yes, I see. The window and the back door. But if Holly came to the door and answered to the killers and was shot there, what's his body doing on the bed? Well, that had me stumped right at first, too. But then I figured the impact of the bullet probably knocked him over onto the bed. He was hit from the body. That gun down there on the floor by Holly's feet, is that the way it was when you found him? Yep. Uh, I picked it up to see if it had been fired, but put it back just the way it was. Mm, let's have a look at it. It's an old Frontier six-shooter, isn't it? That's right. It's Hawley's gun. I've seen it before. Mm, hasn't been fired, not recently anyway. Probably never got a chance to use it. What's this line here, a money box? Yep. Hasn't anybody been into it, though. It's still locked. You know where the keys are? Probably in Hawley's pants pocket. Uh, there's his pants on the floor where he dropped them. I guess he was figuring on putting them on when he went to the door last night. Well, let's see here. I'll look through them and see if I can't find... Yeah, here they are. These are his keys. I guess this little one here is the one that fits the box. Yeah, looks likely. Hmm. Everything in it looks okay to me. There's money here. Doesn't look as if anything was touched. I reckon if robbery was the killer's motive, it sort of soured on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll take this money box along with us and look it over more thoroughly later on. What about the pants and gun? We'll take them along, too, when we go, Sheriff. And now I want to have another look around outside. Okay. So far, all we've been able to go on are these footprints. If we could only find a... Say, wait a minute. What's this? What's what? Right down here by the door, lying on the ground there. Right, George. Looks like an empty cartridge shell. Mm, that's what it is, too. Yeah, I've got it. Can you make out what kind of a gun fired it, Nichols? Mm-hmm. It was fired by a forty-five automatic. And I reckon it held the bullet that killed young Fletcher. The minute I saw the wound in his head, I figured it was done with a forty-five. Did anyone else work for Holly? Yeah, he had a Spanish girl. Consuela Mendoza's her name. She works in the store. Is she anywhere around? Well, I thought I saw her here. Yep, there she is. Out there in the crowd. Well, have her come inside. I want to talk to her. In the back there? <laughs> no, of course not, Sheriff. Have her come around the front of the store. I'll talk to her there. Okay. Contrella. Contrella, come here, will you? Captain Nichols wants to talk to you. Now, I want you to answer my questions truthfully, Consuela, and tell me everything you know about this. Don't try to hold anything back. Si, senor. How long have you worked for Mr. Hawley? About two years, senor. Do you know of any enemies he might have had, anyone he'd had trouble with? Well, there were two brothers, senor. Their names, I think, are Engels. Sometimes these men, they would quarrel with senor Holly. Uh, what about, you know? They had trouble over a piece of ground. A piece of ground? Uh -huh. How do you mean? Well, I don't know exactly. I think it was about what you call 
right away, something <laughs> like that. You mean the right of way over some piece of property? Well, see, si, senor, maybe you are right. Did they become very angry? Were there ever any fights? Fights? Oh, no, senor. Sometimes I think there will be and I get all excited. But no, they cool off and get over their mad for a little while. It was very disappointing. Oh, I see. And you don't think it was serious enough for there to have been a killing over? Oh, no, senor. If it was not worth a punch in the eye, it was not worth to kill over. Is there anything else you might tell me? Anything that would give me a clue as to who committed this murder? I don't think so, senor. Only it wasn't me. <laughs> no, no, I think we can be reasonably certain of that, Consuelo. Gracias, senor. And if that's all that you can think to tell me, let me go now. Si, senor. But if you should think of anything you feel we ought to know, don't hesitate to get in touch with either Sheriff Bryson or myself at once. Si, senor, at once. Uh, the coroner's come after the bodies like you ordered, Nichols. They're taking them into Corazosa. Corazosa? Sure, and so it's too small to have a coroner of their own. Dr. Kelly acts as coroner for this part of the county. Oh, yes, yeah, sure. I know Dr. Kelly. He thinks he'll have a report for you sometime this evening. Fine. Meanwhile, I'm going to check around these parts and find out if anybody's bought a forty-five automatic recently. And you'd say that both men died instantly, is that it, Dr. Kelly? I'm certain of it, Captain Nichols. And chances are Hawley's had the light on in his room. That would make him stand out as a target when he came to the door. So we can reason from that that the killer or killers were dead shots. Well, that's not so unusual in this part of the country. And personally, I think everything points to there being two killers involved. My report agrees with that of the ballistics experts. Each of the men was shot by a different caliber bullet. That's right. Fletcher with a forty-five automatic and Hawley with a bullet from a thirty thirty carbine. The problem now lies in finding those two guns. Once we have them, I think the case will be solved. And that don't look like it's going to be so easy. I spent the whole afternoon getting around to the stores and trying to find out if anybody's bought a forty-five automatic or the shells for one recently. By George. Now, let me think. I sold a forty-five automatic and some shells for it only a week ago. I have a hardware store here in Carrizoza, you know. Yes, that's what I understand. Do you remember who you sold it to, Doctor? It was, uh, yes, it was Randall Mixon. He's a young fellow with a ranch up near Ancho. Randall Nixon, eh? Now, what do you suppose that young scamp wants with a forty-five automatic? He does all his hunting with a rifle. Oh, you know him, do you, Sheriff? Sure. He and his old man homesteaded a place up there. He has a brother, Louie, homesteading not far away from him. Well, I'm not so sure it won't be worth our while to take a run up there in the morning and have a talk with young Nixon. No, I don't reckon it'll be a lick of miss. Anyway, we've got to do something pretty quick. Public sentiment's getting higher all the time against this Mexican, Pedro Sanchez. Well, Sanchez is a pretty bad egg. Sure, I know. But I don't think he had a hand in this. And besides, we don't want any lynchings here in Corazosa. Why? Do you think the crowd's out of hand enough about this Mexican to try anything like that, Sheriff? You can't tell, but I'll feel a sight easier about things after we make an arrest. <laughs> Long barrel? No, the barrel wasn't long. It was a saddle gun. 
Do you know if Mr. Mixon Sr. and his son Randall are at their ranch now? I'm sure I don't know. Well, thank you, Mrs. Mixon. He won't disturb you any longer. That's all right. Well, uh, goodbye, Mrs. Mixon. Goodbye, sir. This business about a 30-30 was a shot in the dark. But it worked, by golly. Yep, it did. Now the only question is, is it the same 30-30 as was used in the killing? That's something we'll have to find out later. Well, we might as well get along up to Randall Mixon's place now. With a little luck, maybe we'll find the guns up there. One of them, anyway. There's Louie out back. His wife was right about him being up here. Well, let's talk to him before we go up to the house. Whatever you say. Hello, Louie. How are you? Oh, hello, sir. What are you doing up this way? Oh, just come up on a little business. Hey, uh, is your father and brother at home? No, they're not, sir. They both rode in to Corso so early yesterday morning and haven't got back yet. What did they go in for, do you know? Well, yes, they wanted to borrow some money. Borrow some money? You know what for? They had a $100 note that was due at the bank. They're trying to raise money to meet it. You figure they're still in town now, huh? Well, they're going to try to sell a couple of horses. They rode the horses in, so maybe that's what held them up. They may have called on some of the ranchers around here. Mm-hmm. Is your mother at home? Yeah, she's in the house. Okay, thanks. I want to talk to her a few minutes before I leave. There ain't nothing wrong, is there, Sheriff? Not so far. Howdy, Sheriff. I saw you standing out here, so I thought I'd come out and say hello. Yeah, howdy, Mrs. Mixon. Uh, we come by to ask a few questions. Yeah? What about, Sheriff? Well, for one thing, uh, we want to know where your husband and Randall were yesterday. Why, they was right here. You mean they were at home all day yesterday, Mrs. Mixon? Yeah, of course. Well, what about the day before yesterday? They was home all day that day, too. Yeah. What do you make of that, Sheriff? I'd say a couple of stories don't fit. Well, what do you mean? There's been some trouble at Ancho, Mrs. Mixon, and we're making investigations. Well, I'm afraid you'll have to come along into town with us. Look, Sheriff, I'm not trying to be unreasonable or anything, but... Uh, I wish you'd tell me why you're taking me back to Corus Oso with you. You'll find out when we get there, Louie. Now, just take it easy. But well, what have I done? As far as I know, you haven't done anything that'll get you into trouble. The worst you have to look forward to for the present, at any rate, is just a little questioning. Yeah, but I don't see what... Uh, oh, there, there's Dad and Randall coming up the road. You mean those two men on horseback? Uh-huh. Sure enough. That's Ben and Randall, all right. Hi. Hey, Ben. Do you and Randall mind riding over to the car? We want to talk to you a minute. Uh, howdy, Sheriff. I see you got Louie with you. Hi, yeah. Dad. Hi, Randall. You mind telling me where you been? Dad and I are on the way over to Corazoso. Yeah? Well, what was the reason you went to Corazoso? Well, I... I owe the bank $100, and I was trying to borrow the money. Yeah. Did you get it? No, not yet. Your name's Randall, isn't it? Randall Mixon? That's right. What did you do with that forty-five automatic pistol you bought from Dr. Kelly a few weeks ago? Well, I sold that gun to a fellow named Fred Spears quite a while back. Mm, you did, huh? Sure. And you, Mr. Mixon, what happened to that thirty thirty carbon you borrowed from your son, Louis? Well, I... That is, uh, uh, I lost it off my saddle two or three weeks ago. Hmm. You two don't keep guns in your family very long, do you? Well, what do you mean? You better climb down off those horses, both of you. You're going into Corazosa with us. Hey, yeah, but uh, what about... We'll the... find somebody to get your horses home for you. But in the meantime, we're going to have a little conference over in the county jail. In the jail at Corazoso, Louis, Randall, and the elder Nixon were questioned separately by Assistant District Attorney Cuba Clayton and Captain Nichols. Louis... Did your brother Randall ever show you a forty-five automatic that belonged to him? Yeah, a few weeks ago he showed me a gun like that. He said he bought it from Dr. Kelly here in Corsoso for $15. Was the gun loaded? I think it was, yeah. Did Randall mention whether or not he'd ever used the gun? He said he'd kill a rabbit with it. Said it was a very good gun. Did Randall or your father ever borrow your thirty thirty carbon? Well, Randall did. We went hunting together one day, but instead of returning the rifle, uh, he took it on home with him. What for? I don't know, Mr. Clayton. Did you ever see the rifle after that? Well, yeah, about a week later at my pa's house. And that's the last time, huh? Uh-huh. Did you see your father or brother last Friday, that is, on July 23rd? No. 
I went by their place and saw them all, but they weren't home. Did you see them on the following day? Yeah, they came over to my house early in the morning. Dad wanted to use a saddle of mine, and I told him to go ahead. And they rode off. I didn't see him again until we picked him up on the road a while back. Did you ever know a man by the name of Fred Spears? Hmm? Well, yeah. yeah. I met a fellow by that name once in uh, Lima, Oklahoma. That was about 1925, though. What did he look like? Oh, well, he's a big, broad-shouldered fellow. Very dark-complected. I judge he's middle-aged. Had uh, black hair that's turning gray. All right, that's all for the present, Louie. Sorry we have to hold you like this. Well, I don't suppose you can have it. Uh, see you later. Then Randall makes it in. Yes, sir. Come on in, Randall. Sit down. Thanks. I want you to tell me all about how you happened to buy that forty-five automatic, Randall, and why. Well, like I told you, I met this fellow Fred Spears. He wanted to trade me a shotgun for a pistol. I didn't have a pistol, so I decided to buy one. You mean just to make the trade? Yes. Dr. Kelly showed me one he had for $15. And I didn't have but 13 so I borrowed $2 from Dad. Was your father with you when you bought the gun? Yes. He was with me when I turned over the gun to Fred Spears. Did this man Spears give you the shotgun at the time? No. He said he'd have it for me a little later. Then he never did show up, and I never saw him again. Seems to me you were kind of a sucker, weren't you? Yes, yes, I suppose I was. Did you ever have this gun at your home, or did you ever show it to your brother, Louie? No. I told Louie about buying the gun, but I never showed it to him. Where did you meet Spears to give him the gun? From the bank. And the gun was never out of your possession from that moment until you brought it around and turned it over to Spears? That's right. I came straight from the store and gave it to him. Did you ever borrow Louie's thirty thirty carbon for any reason? No. When Louie came here first, about 18 months ago, he had the rifle with him. He left it at our house. It's been there ever since. Where is it now? Two or three weeks ago, Dad came back from a ride and said he'd lost it. He never went back to look for it. How did you put in the day last Friday? Well, I worked around the place all morning. In the afternoon, Dad and I went out looking for a stray cow, Louie's. He didn't get home until between 9 and 10 o'clock that evening. What did you do then? We went right to bed. What about the next day, Saturday? Dad and I rode over to Louis early in the morning. He borrowed a saddle from my brother, and we rode around to some of the ranches we knew trying to sell a couple of horses. Did you come into Corazoto? Yeah, not until early in the evening. Where did you spend the night? Oh, with some friends who live out of ways. It was coming back from there when you arrested us. Can you describe this man Fred Spears for us? He's a very tall fellow, about 35 years old. Has auburn hair and wears a little red mustache. Mm, that's all for the time being, Randall. Am I free to go now? No, I'm afraid we'll have to hold you. But I don't... I'll talk to you later, Randall. Mm, all right. That's the way it's got to be. Well, Mr. Clayton, what do you make of things now? I don't think there's any question but that Randall and his father are the killers. That's the way I look at it, too. Randall's and Louie's stories conflict in nearly every regard. The old man tells a story enough like Randall's to convince me they must have rehearsed it. Mm -hmm. That was my impression, too. The only detail in which the old man's story differed from Randall's was in the description of Fred Spears. Mixon described the same man to us that Louie did, a man he'd known years ago and hadn't seen again until Randall gave him the forty-five. Personally, I don't think there is such a person as Fred Spears, at least not the one that Randall told us about. He probably remembered the name from hearing his father and brother talk about a Fred Spears they'd known in Oklahoma. Well, Sheriff Grayson hasn't been able to locate anyone like that. Our problem now, Nichols, is to find those guns. And the sooner the better. I'm going back out to the Mixon Ranch and have a good look around. I've got a hunch I'll find something, Clayton. <laughs> Nixon, there's something I'd like to get straight on. You told us your husband and your son had been at home all day, both on Friday and on Saturday. They claimed to have been away from the ranch on both occasions. Well, uh, uh, well, they told me to say that. They told you to say that? Why? They said they was going out hunting for deer. It was out of season. They wanted me to cover things up for them in case there was any trouble. I see. It, it, it won't get me in trouble, Willis. 
No, it won't get you in any trouble, but it hasn't helped their case any. Then what I better do? The best thing for you to do is to answer my questions as straightforwardly as you know how. Yeah. I found this pair of shoes in one of the rooms. In fact, I found two pair together. Who do they belong to? Well, that pair belongs to Mr. Nixon. I suppose the other pair belongs to Randall. They're both a little muddy. Do you happen to remember whether or not they were worn by the men last Friday? Yes, I, I think they were. But you're not sure? Yes. Yes, I, I'm sure. That's all, Mrs. Nixon. And thank you. <laughs>
Theater, Frederick Lindsay, bidding you good night for Rio Grande. Next week at this time, Rio Grande will present The Case of the Man with the Iron Pipe. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.